talk of the day. So hello everyone. I'm Jacob Shriver and I'm a postdoc working with Anshul Kandaje at Stanford. And I'm really excited to have the opportunity to introduce you all to dragon fruit, which is a method that we've been developing for dissecting the cis and trans regulatory factors that underpin chromatin accessibility at single cell resolution. And you might ask, do we really need this method to work at single cell resolution? Do we really need to work at that? And I would say that uh, Dana in her keynote, among many others at this conference, have been explaining just how important it is to look at everything that's happening in a single cell data set. So, uh, and this is because most biological processes are continuous. Consider, for example, cellular reprogramming. Uh, this is a data set that was collected by Mo and initially analyzed by Sarag. So on the left here, I have a cartoon describing what's going to be going on in the data. In the middle, I'll have a UMAP showing the chromatin accessibility. And on the right-hand side, we'll have an unpaired RNA-seq experiment, which are focusing on the four Yamanaka factors. So here we start off with just pure dermal fibroblasts. Then they're infected with uh, Sendai virus factors that overexpress OSK and M. After two days, we see that a lot has happened, including the emergence of a population of cells that have very high transcript abundance for OSKM, which you'd expect. After two more days, things continue to progress, and we see that now this population seems to have diminished in transcript abundance for those four factors. Then over time, we see that more and more of this UMAP starts to fill out until around day 12, when we get to pre-IPSC cells. These cells are, start to have um, characteristics of iPSC cells, but they're not quite there yet. After another two days, that starts to fill out. And then after around two more weeks, we have pure iPSC cells. I'd like to just say at this point that those insights aren't entirely based off of this UMAP. They're based off of a lot of analysis, and I'm just gliding over that for right now. So just by looking at the cells as they appear over days, you might have started to pick out some of the major trajectories. It seems like over here, there's kind of the no factor uptake trajectory that these cells just were fibroblasts, the virus never infected them, and they just hung out until we killed them and measured them. Then we have the primary reprogramming trajectory. These cells start off as fibroblasts, they get fully reprogrammed, and they end up as iPSCs. But you'll note that a lot is happening here, that initially the cells that take up the viruses have high ectopic expression of ox, ox, KLF and MEC. This is a change in trans regulation. These factors then go and bind to their binding sites, opening up chromatin and affecting uh, and binding them. Cis regulation. Then those changes in cis regulation change endogenous gene expression. Trans regulation. Those proteins then go and affect their binding sites, cis regulation, and this continues on and on, kind of like a uh, differential equation until you reach a steady state which is iPSCs. So even though this is a continuous process, the most common ways of analyzing single cell data still kind of treated as discrete. For example, you might cluster based off of annotation using k-means. In our initial analysis, uh, Sarag used k-means in order to get these clusters, which weren't necessarily uh, distinct cell states. They were just kind of landmarks. Anshul talked about this a little bit in his keynote if you have the opportunity to attend that. Uh, but the idea is basically this. You take cells, you assign them to a cluster. Then you aggregate reads across all of the cells into pseudobulks. Then you organize those pseudobulks according to some notion of pseudotime. And then you can look at loci to see whether or not they change across the entire trajectory. It took me an entire day to make that gift, so I'm going to force you to watch it. <laughs> all right. So this is the nanog locus, which is involved in reprogramming. OK, so then once you have these discrete clusters, a common thing you can do is train machine learning models that take in sequence and try to make predictions. Here you can see that you take in sequence. We have a set of 15 models, uh, Chrome BPNet models in this case. And you can see the predictions on the right hand side. And it seems like each one of them is fairly accurate for the cluster that it was trained on. But as others in this session have pointed out, these predictive models, like predictions aren't exactly useful for these predictive models. There's no more secret genome that we need to make predictions for. What they're useful for is being able to do interpretations. And so here we can use deep lift, deep chap in order to see how the regulatory factors change across these clusters. 
And so you can see here that there's a binding site of oxox that is not very high attributed to in the fibroblast cluster at the beginning, which makes sense because oxox are expressed in fibroblasts, but then that turns on during the reprogramming trajectory. So how do we extend this type of analysis to single cell data? Basically, we have data that looks like this. We have cells as our rows, we have loci as our columns, and we want to make predictions for one of those pixels. Well, we need some representation of our loci, which is probably going to be DNA sequence. We need some representation of our cells, which is complicated, but I'm going to get to in a second. Uh, and then we need what we're predicting, which in this case is chromatin accessibility. But if any of you have actually looked at the reads from a single cell uh, attack seek experiment, you'll notice they don't look like that. They're not a pile up, it's very sparse. So what we're actually predicting is a dynamic pseudobulk, where along a k-nearest neighbor graph, we're just summing the reads along the nearest cells to each other. And you can change that based on the number of reads that are in your cells. So what is our model? Well, we start off with the basic components. That's the convolutional neural network that takes in sequence and makes prediction for a profile. Then, because we're dealing with attack seek data, uh, we need to model the TN5 bias. And I'm going to show what the, this means in a second. But this is a component that is necessary when dealing with attack seek data based pair resolution. Then finally, we use our cell representations. We run them through a few layers. And this is a key point. What we are predicting are the parameters of these convolutions. So we're taking in the cell representation. We're processing it a little bit. And then we are predicting the parameters of the convolutions that you then scan over the sequence. So uh, finally, we take in log read depth, which again is something that's critical for dealing with a, a single cell data. And I'm gonna show why that's important here. So there are two key points about this model. The first is that what this allows you to do is any analysis you are currently doing at bulk resolution you can now trivially extend to single cell resolution because de facto you have one model per cell. You are using a cell representation to create one model for each cell. So anything you can do at bulk resolution, you can do at single cell resolution. The second is that this cell representation is incredibly general. It can be derived from the same attack seek experiment if you want. If you have multimodal data, it can be gene expression, right? If you have spatial coordinates, it, uh, you know, protein concentrations, you can use whatever you want. It just needs to be some vector representation of your cell that you trust. Okay, so let's walk through the components of this. Let's start off with read depth. Um, do we need to include read depth? And for anyone who's dealt with single cell data, you probably know the answer is yes. So here's um, what our model looks like when we try to predict CTCF across the different cell states. You can see here that for, I love CTCF. I initially hated CTCF because it was always an outlier in all of my analyses until I realized that it being an outlier meant that you could use it to debug your models. And so here, if you look and you look at these predictions of CTCF, you shouldn't be getting these wildly different predictions across different cell states. Well, the reason is because each of the different cell states have different read depths. And when you correct for that, you get the much cleaner predictions here. This matters when you start to look into the underlying biology behind reprogramming. If you look here at oxox, if you didn't correct, you say, oh, well, that one cell state has oxox and the other ones are kind of trivial. But after you correct, you see correctly that oxox is very high at the beginning when the virus is uptake and then slowly diminishes. Okay, so now the bias model. Uh, I love talking about this, but unfortunately this isn't my contribution. Uh, this was originally developed for the Chrome BPNet model, uh, which was a project being led by uh, Nusri and Anna in the lab. Uh, they're going to have a preprint coming out soon, so look for that. But I love showing this, and hopefully some of you haven't seen these results yet, so that you can be very impressed and, you know, be very impressed with me, what I, what I mean. Okay, so here are the experimental data for some fibroblast data, just one locus. Here are dragon fruits predictions at that locus. It looks pretty accurate. This is a base pair resolution. <coughs> here is what the bias predictions are for that. And so you can start to see that if you just look at the bias predictions, there are some areas that are very close to the dragon fruit predictions, like specifically here. It looks like these areas are driven by bias. Well, let's remove them and see what happens. Footprints emerge. Footprints are something that people think you thought you could not see in a taxic data. You have to remove this TN5 bias because the fragments that you get in a, a taxic data set are influenced by the sequence specificity of the cutting enzyme. The cutting enzyme has a sequence specificity, which really sucks. But if you account for it like this, you can deal with it. And you see these very clean, nice footprints. All right, 
So let's look at this final component, which is the accessibility model. It's supposed to model the true ac accessibility of the data without any of these cofactors. So if we look at the top hits, the strongest motif affinity hits for AP1, it looks like we get a really strong accessibility of response uh, with a nice footprint right in the middle. So these are the top 25% of motif hits according to the FEMO uh, score. If we adjust that, you can see that as motif affinity goes down, Dragon Fruit predicts lower accessibility. So Dragon Fruit is correctly learning uh, aspects of cis regulatory logic here. It's learning motif affinity. Additionally, if you look across cell state, as the proteins that bind to AP1 decrease in concentration, so too does the predicted accessibility until you get to iPSCs when there's no, sorry, when there's no predicted accessibility. But then you can completely fill this in. And because Dragon Fruit is a continuous model, you can do this continuously across the entire thing. For the purposes of visualization, I'm just focusing on a few snapshots of cell state here. What's really interesting here is that it's not just, oh, accessibility goes down. What you can see is that if you look at the footprint, that the, you can see that the footprint diminishes as an aspect of cis regulation and not as an aspect of trans regulation. And this makes sense. As the motif affinity goes down, the protein is going to bind less to that specific site. Just because the protein concentration goes down doesn't mean that the footprint is going to be as diminished. So that's really an aspect of cis regulation that Dragon Fruit is pulling out. All right. So we then ran some in silico modularization experiments using pairs of motifs. And this was really to highlight a point that I think is important when people are analyzing single cell data. So here we have just if you put the AP1 motif into a random background sequence. You can see that it predicts sort of a peak, uh, it predicts sort of a peak in um, the fibroblast, and then that diminishes over time. If you put ox ox in, there's nothing going on in fibroblast, which makes sense. And then during the reprogramming trajectory, it turns on. If you put both of them on, you get a peak that's always active. And this makes sense intuitively, right? Like if you have a fibroblast, if you have a fibroblast uh, transcription factor, it's going to be active in fibroblasts. And if you have an iPSC transcription factor, it's going to be active in iPSCs. But what I see all the time when people do computational modeling of single cell data is they only take variable peaks. They ignore peaks that are always on because they assume that they're on for some reason that's boring, like CTCF is always on. But peaks that are always on can be on for different reasons. And that's important because it's distinct logic from variable peaks by definition, because they're always active. There has to be something interesting going on there. So if you just discard uh, peaks that are always active, you're going to be ignoring a big part of the cis regulatory code. Okay, so another way of looking at this is to look at the attributions from the model. So here, you'll not be surprised to find out that this is a CTCF binding site. It has a really strong footprint. When we look at the attributions from the bias model, we see largely junk. And when we factor that out and focus just on the accessibility, we get a clean CTCF motif. If we then look at this second footprint, which you might not have seen in the original data, uh, we see something that looks like this. You see there's a whole bunch of stuff ending in a bunch of A's, which is basically how I felt the large time that I was working on this project. Then we see that that's recapitulated in the bias attributions. And when you remove it, you get this really clean NFA half sites that are right next to each other. You wouldn't have noticed that if you hadn't removed the bias from the TN5 enzyme. Okay. So I think I'm doing well on time. So I... Um, I'm looking, this is a locus that's really important for reprogramming. It's the nanog locus. It's one of the things that um, helps drive cells into iPSCs. And so I want to take a quick break um, and talk about gene naming for a second. So nanog is derived from Tier Nanog, which is the iris spring of eternal youth. And that is objectively a very cool name. The gene next to it is called Nanog NB because it is the neighbor of Nanog. <laughs> I have to say that it's an aggressively mid name for a gene that like some genes were really caring about and other ones were not. So we wanted to then dissect the regulatory logic behind Nanog. So we looked here at the promoter. You can see that of course it just turns on over the course of the trajectory. So we can see that it's largely driven by an ox ox binding site, some KLF motifs and Zeb. Uh, if you were to look at the attributions from the snapshot models that we trained originally on the clusters, you would see something like this, where nothing's happening at the fibroblast, which makes sense. And then it turns on, you know, stuff is changing maybe a little bit. But when you use dragon fruit, you can look at these attributions for every single cell. So here, we're looking at this specific ox ox site, and we're coloring the human. 
So I'm coloring the UMAP according to the sum of the attribution score. This isn't like a Cromwell plot, which is just ox ox across the entire genome. This is this specific site. We can then look at this specific site at the same locus, and we can see that it has different dynamics. Uh, I don't have a plot for this, but you can also look at each of the KLF ones here <laughs> and see that motif affinity here is driving differences in accessibility and differences in attribution. Dragon Fruit doesn't know what an activator or oppressor is. It takes in no prior knowledge, but it identifies that this Zeb binding site that you can barely see here is a repressor of chromatin accessibility. It's something that basically keeps something, um, keeps the site closed, and then over the reprogramming trajectory, it goes away. And so it helps keep things open. And so without any you know, prior knowledge, Dragon Fruit is able to identify that as uh, giving it negative attribution scores. So we can start to create some cool plots with this. Uh, for this, we can look at every single cell across the trajectory and see that OxOx initially increases in attribution, which makes sense because in other experiments, we've seen that it increases in expression, uh, and then stays high and then goes down. KLF4 goes down immediately. Zeb go, you know, starts to go away. Uh, and then if we want to look across multiple loci that control the same gene, in this case, maybe uh, looking at Nanog, we can start to make more complicated plots. So here what we have is the predictive accessibility of the Nanog promoter. It's kind of difficult to see here, but it does change a little bit. Uh, this is just over the reprogramming trajectory. For each one of the sites, uh, of the binding sites that we care about, we can add it to this clock. And you, so each one of the you know, seconds along here is a different cell, and it's colored according to the attribution score of that element. But we don't, we're not limited to just looking at one site. If we will care about Nanog, we presumably also care about the enhancers and we want to look at them at the same time. So here, here's the Nanog enhancer. Uh, we can see that ends up, it starts off really strong and then it becomes weaker over the course of the trajectory. But it's not just, oh, it's weaker over the course of the trajectory. We can see that different motifs turn off faster because they have different affinities. That's what's going on here. That's why there are multiple after you know, KLF sites that appear different. They have different motif affinities, and so they are less likely to be bound. And so using this type of clock, we can really dissect what's going on in specific genes. All right, so just to conclude, Dragon Fruit offers a new model for capturing cis and trans regulatory factors underpinning chromatin accessibility. You can look at this either by using denoised marginalized, you know, denoised footprints, either just across the genome or in, in silico experiments, or you can use attributions. Both of these analysis modules are useful and can help you answer biological questions. I obviously didn't have time to go into everything that we have here, but we have some other ideas that are going to be in the preprint. We want to have the preprint out by August, which means it'll probably be out by November. Uh, some of those things include attribution velocities, which kind of extend the idea of RNA velocity to this attribution space. Uh, there are also a lot of really interesting stuff going on in transient peaks, peaks which are only active for a little point in time, and continuous models can really help there. And so finally, I just want to remind everyone that everything in genomics is continuous. When we talk about things like this is an OCT binding site, it's not just an OCT binding site binary that there's a motif affinity there that really matters. Cell types aren't really one thing. There's a continuum across them. Protein concentration, signal strength, everything is continuous. And the more things in biology we can model continuously, the more rare things we're going to be able to model well. So finally, I want to thank Sarag for all his help with this analysis, on top of my PI, as well as the brains behind the operation. Thank you. Thank you, nice talk. So maybe I'm, I'm curious about this idea of protein concentrations mentioned because it might be maybe anything in follow that is only chromatin accessibility. And then maybe on that point, I was wondering maybe the case for ox socks being most likely explained by transcription factor cooperativity and not by independent concentration. So you can have a strong binding size only dependent by one factor and not the other. Maybe that's such an upcoming comment. Yeah, so that's a good question. So for the first part, um, for the first part, this data here was an attack seq data set with a parallel RNA seq data set. And so we did for, it's not that for each cell we had RNA seq, but for the major observations, we were able to um, check that with the RNA seq data. 
Um, and the second question was, you, I'm not sure I fully understood it. You're saying that for Ox. Yes. One is costing everything without the other one very much. Yes. You're saying basically that Sox is the one that's binding and bringing Oct along for the ride? I, think we, I, I mean, I, yes, I think that that's an interesting point. Uh, it's not something that I've looked into a lot right now, but we should talk more after. Yeah, hi. Um, I was really impressed by your footprints that you got after your bias model. And you showed us a couple of factors. So for how many transcription factors can you now get such footprints? Uh, so conceptually, any motif that you want to put in, you can do. I think that we found that there are around 30 or so TFs that have distinct footprints. Um, I don't. I have made this figure, but I don't have it as part of the slide showing the footprints for around 30 uh, TFs across cell states. And you can distinguish a TF by footprint, or you need the motifs? I mean, do they have distinct patterns? Oh, um, that is not something that I've looked into. Yeah, thank you, very interesting talk. Just uh, very quickly, um, do you have you pursued any experiments like to validate uh, all these findings? And particularly when we talk about affinity binding, do you have any biochemical actually evidence for this? Because that's actually a really interesting concept. I'm just concerned how the model is aware of, for example, the fact that uh, there are different types of uh, you know, factors such as you know the pioneering ones that you know their binding affects actually as you mentioned. Uh, the overall enhancer accessibility, but there are others that you know, they are not. So yeah, how much you know, experiments have you done to validate this? I think that, so there, there's a preprint that's gonna be coming out soon with Sarag's work, where he was doing a lot of this work um, in the bulk resolution. And I think that they have a lot of experiments there validating uh, the predictions that they're doing. For the dragon food work, we have not done any further experiments. Um, I think that largely we've been relying on validating things that other people have found so far. All right, uh, there was an online question, uh, which we should probably end with. Um, basically, the question is, can we use transcription factor concentrations to predict the cell states that yes. feed into the model? That's a great question. Yeah, so anything that you can want to use to represent cell state, you can. That if you have gene expression, or if you have, you know, gene expression, protein abundance, et cetera, you can use anything as long as it can be vectorized into some, you know, some vector representation of every cell. And so because this data wasn't multimodal, uh, we couldn't use expression. But we have other data sets that we are applying dragon fruit to where we do plan to use um, potentially SCVI in order to get our representations.